Timberline, you may sit down if the ushers would come forward for the bucket offering.
And as they come forward, when you guys get up here, you guys can go ahead. One thing I'd like to say about the offering, so this is not our normal offering. This is our special offering for extreme poverty. Everything that goes in these buckets goes directly to um, a couple villages now, I guess, that we have worked with and are working with in Guatemala. So one update I wanted to give. You've heard us talk a lot about raising money to be able to provide food bags to two different villages, Piedras Negras, which we had been working with for many years, and El Mirador, which is now a village that we are teamed with and will be teamed with for a while. In the past couple of weeks, we've raised over $13,000, which is an incredible amount of money to come in in a very short period of time. So thanks for your generosity there. Um, we were about a little over $1,000 short, um, maybe close to $1,500 short of the final number that we needed. But we went ahead and wrote the check and um, are going to be able to provide food bags to both villages, which is a really incredible blessing. Um, so thank you for that. We are confident that the Lord will continue to provide. We are still looking to raise that last 1000 to 1500 So keep that in mind as you pray and as you give. But thanks so much. Um, a couple announcements coming up um, tonight. Bible quizzing will be at Petra Church. So if you'd like to go cheer on our quizzers as they study God's word and show others what they have learned, that'll be at 6 o'clock at Petra tonight. Tomorrow is our congregational meeting, and I would really encourage all of you, if you call Timberline your church to at least have one representative from your house, if not everybody here, to hear what's going on. This is just a really important time as a body. So I would encourage you to come out tomorrow. That's at 7 o'clock here in the auditorium. And then coming up on March 18th is an opportunity to attend Stewardship University, which is put on by Everence Financial, which is a, um, a Christian-run, Mennonite-run um, financial institution. And they have done just incredible good in our community at large. They've done incredible good in my own life. They do like financial advising. Um, they have their own credit union and or bank, whichever it's called. Anyway, so this is a day seminar talking about finances from a kingdom perspective. And so they've got financial workshops talking about budgeting, women's finances, women and, well, I'm not actually sure what women and finances means, but that's the topic of the, that's the title of the topic. How to live simply and intentionally as kingdom people. Um, legacy planning and thinking about the future. They also have some community impact. You know, they're not just talking about money and your money. They're also thinking about how this affects the community. So they've got topics like cultivating community resources, um, churches helping to address the current housing crisis in Lancaster County. So the, it's, a, it's a morning workshop from eight to one. There's lots of different breakout sessions. Um, and so it's just a really cool opportunity to, to learn more about how we can be intentional. You know, we're called to be disciples of Jesus in every area of our lives, including the financial realm of our lives. So how can we do that intentionally, not just us by ourselves, but also as a network and community? So that is March 18th from 8 to 1, a really cool opportunity. If you're interested or have any questions, you can talk to Lindsay. You can register online. That's the last of my announcements. So if you'd like to stand up and say hi, let's continue worshiping the Lord today.
It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness? He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all His body the bread His blood the wine broken and poured out Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. The ransom from heaven, Jesus the
name above all names blessed redeemer Emmanuel the rescue for sinners the ransom Jesus Messiah, Lord of Jesus Messiah, Lord of the Lord of all.
Cause no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. that you have called us by name individually. You've called us out from the darkness, from our shame, from our regrets. Lord, you've called us out of our sin and our shame. You've called us one of your own, one of your own children. We're, Lord, we're so thankful that we get to look upon your face and see a light and see a hope. God, we thank you so much for that hope. Lord, we've failed so many times, but you have always remained faithful we get to come back to you, and Lord, you are always there. Your mercy is always new every morning. We thank you, Lord.
saved and that we are called blessed. Jesus, we praise you this morning. We give you all the honor and all the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask the ushers to come up for our normal morning offering. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning again in humility and in awe of your greatness and your goodness in our lives. Father, you have given us everything, the very air in our lungs, the very life that we have that comes from you. And you have given us our greatest gift of all. You've given us your son as a sacrifice on our behalf. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you with our whole beings. We praise you with with the words of our mouth, with the meditations of our heart, and we praise you with the gift of our hands as well. So, Father, we ask that you would take these gifts this morning, that you would consecrate them for your use. We give them freely for your honor and for your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. morning. My name's Keith. I'm one of the pastors here at Timberline. Um, Like I think from what I'm hearing, many of you, I've been fighting a bit of a cold this week. So um, I will ask you to bear with me and your patience if I erupt in the middle of the service in a coughing fit. So hopefully we'll avoid that and we'll soldier on here this morning. In the 1920s in Germany... There were two brothers named Adolf and Rudolf Dassler, and they founded a shoe company. It was then called the Dassler Brothers Shoe Factory. Now, like a lot of brothers, they had their squabbles and their conflicts and their arguments. They tended to fight quite a bit, but they were able to set aside their disagreements and run a successful business. At least they were until one night in the middle of World War II. Rudolph and his family were hiding in a bomb shelter during an Allied bombing raid, and and in the middle of the raid, Adolf came running down the stairs to join them. And the first thing he said when he ran into the shelter was, the bloody blankety blanks are here again. Now, he used a little bit more vulgar language than that. Now, Adolf swore that he was referring to the Allied bombers. But Rudolph, for some reason, was convinced that his brother was actually referring to him and to his family, and no one could convince him otherwise. And from then on, their relationship went from bad to worse, and shortly after the war, 
they dissolved their business, and they each went on to found their own separate shoe company. Adolf named his after himself, taking his nickname Addy and combining it with the first three letters of his last name. Rudolph originally called his company Ruda, but then changed it to the name of a certain type of wildcat. And the rivalry and friction between Adidas and Puma remains to this day. Now, history is full of similar stories. Petty grudges and misunderstandings erupting into world-changing conflicts, sometimes with near-apocalyptic results. And it's disturbing because we look at those conflicts now and we think, why didn't someone just say, I'm sorry? Why is it so difficult to say we are sorry? And why is it so difficult to admit or accept someone's apology? Why is forgiveness so hard? It's been said that grudges are some of our most treasured possessions. Why is that? Someone else has said that holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So why do we do it? Well, this morning we are going to be continuing on in our study of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be looking at this idea of forgiveness. So I'm going to ask you this morning as we start to stand with me as we read the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help this morning. We pray that as we look at your word, that your spirit would teach us this morning and would speak to us. Pray that we would have open ears and open hearts and open minds. I pray that you would enable all of us to lay aside the distractions of the week, that our focus would be on you and you alone, and that we would hear from you. Father, I ask that the things that I have to say that are from you, that you would use to whatever effect you intend. And, Lord, if there's things that I have to say that are just from myself, Lord, I pray that you would allow them to fall on deaf ears. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I want to try and answer three very, very fundamental questions about forgiveness, and you can find them in your notes. You can follow along, but they're simply this. Why do I need to ask for forgiveness? Why do I need to forgive others? And how do I forgive? Look with me again at Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, a couple of real quick explanations and some observations before we get into the questions. First thing we have to notice is that in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, he uses the Greek word for debts. But in Luke's version, he uses the Greek word for sin. So which is it? Now, is Matthew actually talking about financial debts and Luke's talking about something different, or are they both talking about the same thing? Well, without getting into the weeds of things, there's a little bit going on here. Matthew, again, seems to be using some rather obscure Greek words, and there's some things going on in Aramaic here as well, which is the language that Jesus spoke. But after you wade through all of that, the bottom line is that in this context, it's safe to assume that when Jesus says, forgive us our debts, He's referring to more than just financial debts. He's referring to the sins, the things that we have committed against God. He's referring to the moral debt that we owe. And when he says, as we forgive our debtors, he's saying we we are to forgive those who have sinned against us, to those who owe us a moral debt. The secondly, an observation. This is the only petition in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus feels compelled to offer a deeper explanation of. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, the first two verses immediately after the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now when we read that, if nothing else, it ought to make you sit up a little bit straighter and pay a little closer attention. Why does Jesus feel the need to double down on this particular petition? It's almost like he's saying, hey, just in case you missed it, 
That part was really, really important. You need to pay attention. Another observation we need to make is that this petition comes in two parts. Jesus says that we should pray to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is why the ancient church father, St. Augustine, called this the most dangerous prayer in the Bible. And the great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said this about this petition. Unless you forgive others, you read your own death warrant when you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our petition for forgiveness has two aspects, one inward and one outward. We are to pray that God would forgive us of our debts and our trespasses and our sins, but then we're also to turn that forgiveness outward and forgive those who have sinned or trespassed against us. And then Jesus links these two together and tells us emphatically that if we don't forgive others, then we won't be forgiven. That's quite a statement, and it certainly raises some questions. First question, why do I need to ask for forgiveness? Well, the first part of this answer is pretty simple. We need to ask for forgiveness because we owe a debt that we cannot pay. This is the foundational truth of the gospel. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us plainly that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah tells us that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. Psalms tells us that there's no one righteous, not even one. So our natural state is one of rebellion toward God who created us. Our every thought, our every action is continually bent towards evil and away from God. And the price of that rebellion is death. Because God in his righteous justice will give us what we want. And what we want in our sinful nature and our natural state is independence from God. Which is what death is. Death is eternal independence from God. God is the source of all light and life, and apart from him, there is only darkness and death. And so when you rebel against God, when you declare not your will be done, but my will be done, God will give you the desire of your heart. But understand clearly what you're choosing, because you're choosing death. And there's only one way back to God. It's to admit you're wrong. It's to ask for forgiveness. It really is that simple. It is to humble yourself and turn to God and say, I was wrong. I can't live life apart from you. My independence has been my destruction. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And so we need to ask for forgiveness because we have sinned against God. And there's no way we can undo our sin. We can't possibly make amends for it. We can't pay the price because the price is death. And so we ask for forgiveness for the debt we cannot pay. And we claim in faith the substitution that's been provided for us. Jesus Christ, who could and did pay the price for our sin in dying on the cross in our place. So that debt would be forgiven. And now we can stand before the king of the universe and be declared righteous. That is why we ask for forgiveness. But there's still a question that remains. Let me rephrase the question slightly. Why do I need to ask for forgiveness every day? Another way of asking this question would be, if I don't ask for forgiveness every time I sin, does that mean that my sins aren't forgiven? What if I sin, and before I can ask for forgiveness, I die? What happens then? Where do I go? Aren't all my sins already forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross? And if that's true, then why do I need to continually ask for forgiveness for something for which I've already been forgiven? Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, having been justified. It's past tense. It's something that's already happened to us. And justified is an important word. It means that at the moment that we turn in repentance and faith and accept Christ's gift of salvation freely offered to us, God now declares that our sins are forgiven and that Christ's righteousness now belongs to us. And the result is that in God's eyes, we are now justified, we are now declared righteous. And this is something that's done once and done. We aren't justified anew every day. We're justified once for all. Consider Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. 
It says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is pretty clear that at the moment of salvation, God forgives us all of our trespasses. Psalm 103 says that he cast them as far as the east is from the west. Hebrews says that he will remember our sins no more. So if our sins are forgiven and they're remembered no more, then why do we need to keep asking for forgiveness? It is true that at the moment of salvation, we are justified and our sins are forgiven. All of our past sins, all of our present sins, all of our future sins, they're all nailed to the cross. Our position in life changes in an instant. We're taken from darkness to life. While we were once enemies of God, we're now adopted into his family. And this, I think, is the key. Because we're now brought into a relationship with God through Christ. And that changes everything. Let me offer an analogy by way of a question. Parents, what would your child have to do for you to disown them? Now, I have three children. Four, if you count my son-in-law, I guess. But I can't think of anything they could possibly do that would cause me to disown them, except for one thing. There is one thing they could do that might be the end of our relationship. But it's so far out there, and so it just would never happen. I almost even hesitate to say it. But there's one thing that would make me reconsider my relationship with my children, and that's if they ever became Cowboys fans. But <laughs> that's it. That's the only thing. Aside from that, aside from that, Anything else, they're still my kids. I love my children unconditionally. And chances are you love your children unconditionally. No matter what they do, they will always be your child. So what if your kid came to you and got in a fight with you and got right up in your face and screamed, I hate you, I wish you were dead. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Do they stop being your child at that moment? No. No. Do you still love them? I hope so. Are they still a member of your family? Yes. Has it affected your relationship? Undoubtedly. Has it put a wall, a barrier between you and your child? Most likely. Has it damaged the intimacy of your relationship? I would think so. So what has to happen to heal the relationship? There needs to be forgiveness. So let me try and make this clear. We need to ask forgiveness for our sins in order to receive salvation because we owe a debt that we cannot possibly pay. And when we turn to Jesus in repentance and forgiveness and accept his gift of salvation, we are made a new creation and our sins are forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. At the moment of salvation, a whole lot of amazing things happened. We're now justified in Christ. God imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. And at that, at that moment, our sins are forgiven. All the sins we had done, all the sins we are doing, all the sins we will do, they're all nailed to the cross. We're now made a member of the family of God and adopted into his family. And our relationship to God has instantly changed. And our position has changed. And now... When we sin as followers of Christ, and we will sin, our position does not change. We are not now suddenly kicked out of God's family every time we sin. We don't lose our salvation every time we sin. Think about it. Would that really be good news? If our salvation was that fragile, that every time you committed a sin, you needed to make sure you asked for forgiveness so that you didn't lose your salvation? We'd be like yo-yos on a string. Now I'm saved, now I'm not. Now I'm saved, now I'm not. There'd be no confidence, no trust. You would live life in a state of fear and anxiety, always paranoid that something somehow had slipped through, that some sin went unaccounted for, and that you would die in your sin. But that isn't the hope of the gospel, and that isn't what Scripture teaches us. We need to ask for forgiveness every day because we sin every day. And so we ask for forgiveness not to restore our salvation, but to restore our relationship. We don't lose our salvation every time we commit a sin, but we do do damage to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We do do violence to the intimacy that He desires to share with us. 
Our sin builds a wall, but forgiveness tears it down. That's why we must ask for forgiveness every day. Second question, why do I need to forgive others? Simple answer to this question is because we have been forgiven. Turn turn with me, if you would, to look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 is a story that Jesus tells, a parable to illustrate this idea, this concept of forgiveness. So in Matthew 18, starting verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I want to stop here a second in the middle of the story because I want to do a little math. Sorry, I didn't didn't know you were coming back to school this morning. but, But I want to help put this parable in perspective. So in Jesus' day, the most basic monetary unit was the drachma, or in Greek, the denarii. And its value was equivalent to one day's worth of labor for an ordinary average worker. It was kind of like the minimum wage at the time. Now, a talent was the highest monetary unit of the time, and it was equal to 6,000 denarii. That means an ordinary worker would have to work 6,000 days to earn one talent. Now, pop quiz, how many talents did the servant owe the king? 10,000 talents. So just for fun, how many denarii would that be? A lot. lot. (laughs) 60 million denarii. Now, to put that in a little bit of perspective, that means that a worker would have to work 60 million days in order to earn that much money. Now, that number still doesn't compute. That equals 164,000 years of labor that the servant owed the king. Now, what was Jesus' point? The point is that the debt was astronomical. There was no possible earthly way this servant could ever pay off that debt. He owed a debt that he had no hope of repaying. So what does he do? He begs, but even his begging is pathetic. He says, please, 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 I'll pay it all back. No, he won't. There's no possible way he will ever pay it back. So what does the king do? The king has compassion on him. He has mercy on him. He forgives the servant all of the debt. He doesn't put him on a payment plan. He doesn't put him on an installment plan. He just says, you know what? Forget it. And he forgives the entire debt. Now, having been forgiven that debt, what would you expect from the servant? How would you think the rest of the story should play out? I mean, you would expect an Ebenezer Scrooge-type transformation here. You would expect that he'd go out and get Tiny Tim the crutches or the surgery or whatever, and that he'd become this great man, that having experienced such overwhelming grace and mercy, that he would be filled with grace and mercy himself. That's that's how we expect the story to play out. But how does it play out? We'll pick up in verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience on me, and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I mean, this is just an absurd story. I mean, what kind of servant who have just been forgiven a debt of 60 million denarii would now go and throw a fellow servant in jail over a measly 100 denarii. It doesn't make sense. And that is exactly the point that Jesus is making. 
how could someone who has experienced the grace and mercy of God's forgiveness turn around and refuse to forgive someone else? It just boggles the mind. It doesn't compute. It makes no sense. And of course, that's the answer to the question. Why do I need to forgive others? Because I have been forgiven. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It just makes sense. When we consider the enormity of the debt that we have been forgiven, how could we possibly refuse forgiveness to those who have wronged us? The debts in comparison are so insignificant. And when you refuse to forgive someone, you're effectively minimizing your own sin. And you're diminishing the sacrifice that Christ paid on your, ha- on your behalf. Because if you really understood the depths of your sin, if you really understood the debt that you owed and the price that Christ paid, you would recognize that any debt owed to you, any sin against you, is just a pittance in comparison. I think this is why Jesus makes such a strong statement in saying if we don't forgive others, we won't be forgiven. I don't think Jesus is trying to argue that we need to forgive other people in order to first be saved. Once again, that would mean we now do something to earn our merit or salvation. I don't think that's the point. Rather, the point is how can we possibly be saved and not forgive others? The truth is is that we have truly experienced the forgiveness of God. If we've tasted his grace and his mercy, there's simply no way we could refuse that to others. Therefore, if you're harboring unforgiveness towards someone, if you're withholding your forgiveness, if you're hanging on to a grudge for whatever reason and refusing to let go, if you're refusing forgiveness, you're standing on very dangerous ground indeed. Understand clearly the implications of your refusal. How can you possibly claim to be forgiven and to be redeemed, but yet refuse to forgive another? It's simply incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know there's more than likely some here this morning who are thinking, yes, but you don't know what they have done to me. You don't know the hurt I've experienced. You don't know how much pain they caused me. And no, I don't. But Jesus does, and he doesn't give you a pass. He still says we're to forgive. Didn't say it would be easy. Forgiveness is often the hardest thing in the world. And the more pain you've experienced, the harder it is to forgive. Which leads us to our third and final question. How do I forgive? Sometimes forgiveness is easy. Sometimes forgiveness is cheap and doesn't cost anything. But sometimes it's hard, really, really hard, and sometimes it can cost more than you can seem to bear. How do you forgive then? How do you forgive when the other party hasn't even asked for your forgiveness? How do you forgive when the other party doesn't even want your forgiveness? How do you forgive when the other party doesn't even recognize that they have offended you? How do you forgive when someone else has put you through incredible, unimaginable pain, pain beyond human endurance? How do you forgive then? How many of you remember where you were on October 2nd, 2006? Anyone? I thought you would, Elsie. (laughs) That's a date that many people in our community will remember for their entire lives. That's the date that Charlie Roberts backed a pickup truck up to a one-room schoolhouse in Nickel Mines, just a few miles from here, at approximately 10.30 in the morning, and a little more than a half hour later, Five young Amish girls were killed, five more seriously wounded, and Charlie had taken his own life. It's a tragedy that has left a permanent mark on our community. But what the world remembers, even more than the tragedy itself, was the response of the Amish community. Because in the wake of unspeakable tragedy, they left an example of forgiveness that made the entire world sit up and pay attention. Within hours of the shooting, members of the Amish community were at the home of the newly widowed Marie Roberts, the wife of the gunman, offering their love and their forgiveness and their support. About 30 members of the Amish community attended the funeral of Charlie Roberts, again in a show of forgiveness and love for the family. The Amish community established a charitable trust to help support Marie and her children, even diverting funds that were given to cover the medical costs of their own children to help support the family of the man who had caused such a tragedy. Marie Roberts was even invited to the funeral of one of the young victims. The world didn't understand that type of forgiveness, and it still doesn't. 
There are actually some commentators and reporters who criticized the Amish for their willingness to forgive, arguing that it made too little of the tragedy and didn't pay proper respect to the victims. And it's not that it was easy. It wasn't that the families didn't mourn their lost daughters. It was clear that they were suffering an immense amount of pain. But yet in the midst of that pain, a choice was made, a choice to extend forgiveness even before it was asked for. One Amish father who lost one child and had another severely wounded said several years later, speaking of the pain and the trauma, he said, but you see, it's a journey. I still made that immediate choice and principle, but it took me a few years until I could feel that I really meant it inside me to forgive Charlie. Our Amish neighbors in the wake of that tragedy taught the world how to forgive. And there's a few lessons for all of us in their example. And so I want to end with four practical ways that we practice forgiveness. So how do I forgive? First, by making a decision to forgive. Forgiveness isn't always easy. No one said it would be. But forgiveness means making a choice, making a decision. And that decision will typically run ahead of your feelings. If you wait until you feel forgiveness, you may never forgive. I am a firm believer that our feelings follow our actions. One of the lies of Satan is that we should follow our hearts, that we should trust our feelings and let our hearts lead us, and what a ridiculous load of rubbish. The Bible tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful, and that is what you want to follow? Good luck. If you're relying on your heart to guide you, you will spend your life hopelessly lost and wandering in circles. Our feelings are lousy guides. That's why you can't rely on your feelings to guide you towards forgiveness. Forgiveness needs to be a decision of the will. It's a choice you must make. Don't worry about your feelings. They will catch up later. But if you let your feelings take the lead, if you let your heart rule your head, you run the risk of wallowing in bitterness and anger your whole life. Do you think those Amish families felt like forgiving Charlie Roberts? Of course not. Who in their right mind would? But they made a decision to forgive, and eventually their feelings caught up. Second, how do I forgive? By returning good for evil. 1 Peter 3.9 says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Now, this isn't an easy thing. I mean, this goes against our nature. When we're wrong, our natural inclination is to lash out, to respond in kind to the hurt that we've received. But we're called as believers to follow a different path. We're told to do good to those who have done evil to us. This means that we forgive those who have wronged us, even if they don't want or desire our forgiveness, even if they don't ask for it. And not only do we forgive, but we're called to go above and beyond forgiveness. We're called to take the hurt, take the evil that's been done to us, and respond with love and with goodness, to bless those who have cursed us. Third thing, we forgive by renouncing our claim to vengeance. We need to respond as Jesus did. Look again at 1 Peter 2. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Excuse me. Jesus didn't seek vengeance, but rather he handed everything over to God, who is the perfect, righteous judge. And that's to be our response as well. Now, we have to understand something here. Forgiveness does not mean that we cannot still pursue justice. Justice is very different from vengeance. It's possible to forgive someone and still want to see justice done. Take a tragedy like Nickel Mines or one of the far too many school shootings we've had in our country. If you were the victim of a horrendous crime like that, if you lost a loved one in a mass shooting, I believe it's absolutely possible to forgive the perpetrator but yet still want to see justice done. Because out of concern for others, we want to see justice done out of concern that it doesn't happen again, and out of concern that others never have to experience the same amount of pain that you've experienced, it's possible to want to see justice done. But that's very different from vengeance, because justice then is others-oriented, others-focused. 
it's focused on the concerns and the needs and the desires of others, not yourself. But vengeance, vengeance is all about you. It's all about easing your pain, your suffering, about seeing things done that will make you feel better. There's no place for vengeance in the Christian life. Justice is a biblical quality. It is a good thing. I can forgive and still want justice, but I can't forgive and want vengeance. Revenge is incompatible with forgiveness, and there's no place for it in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Finally, how do we forgive? By seeking the good of the one forgiven. Luke 6, 27 says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. There's no more sure sign of forgiveness than an earnestly willing and working for the good of the one you have forgiven. The real sign of forgiveness is that you don't seek to punish the other, you seek the good of the other. And again, this was modeled for us at Nickel Mines. The response of the Amish community, and not just forgiving the family of Charlie Roberts, but actively seeking their good to the point of helping them financially in the wake of their loss was a picture of the gospel in action. Forgiving is hard. It's brutally hard at times. But we're called to take a step beyond mere forgiveness. We're called to follow the example of Jesus and to love and serve those who have wronged us. And we can't possibly do this in our own strength, but only through Christ in us can we find that strength. I want to close this morning. We're going to just take some time in silent reflection. I want you to take some time in prayer to consider two questions. Question one is, for what sins do you need to ask for forgiveness? What debts do you need to clear with your Heavenly Father? And the second question is, whose sins do you need to forgive? Who has hurt you? Who has wronged you? Who has brought you pain? Who do you need to forgive?
please stand with me for a benediction? Will you pray with me? Loving Father, we are humbled at so great a salvation that you have given us. We are so grateful for the debt that you forgave us, a debt we could not possibly repay. We thank you for the grace and the mercy you extended us through the death of your Son on the cross. We have been forgiven much. Grant us the strength and the grace to forgive those who have wronged us. Help us to be a people who keep no record of wrongs. Give us the grace to release our grudges and our petty grievances. May we love those who have wronged us the way Jesus has loved us who were once your enemies. You are our king, and we walk in submission to your will. And this is your will, that we would forgive as you have forgiven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.